Microfocus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Gary and I are playing with Flight Simulator here on, on our IBM PC. Uh, this is a good example of how you can use a computer to simulate a real-world situation. That's the subject of today's Computer Chronicles, computer simulations. And later on, we'll be looking at more sophisticated computer simulations, uh, flight simulations, and also the use of computer simulations in architecture and urban design. Gary, it seems to me in a way, uh, let's shut them up there. <laughs> Uh, everything a computer does is really a simulation. What specifically do we mean now when we talk about computer simulations uh, and environments? Well, today's discussion is going to be mostly about generating scenes, generating an environment that is, uh, simulates a situation that uh, someone wants to experience. And you use a lot of graphics and a lot of computing power usually to do that. Uh, the idea is basically that in many cases it's a whole lot cheaper, less, less expensive to generate the environment and test it and work with it than it would be to do the real thing. For example, uh, it's a lot less expensive to run a simulation of a 747 landing with its gear up than it would be to do the real thing. <laughs> so this is going to be a, a, the kind of discussion we'll talk about, generating the real world situations with a computer system. Okay, to start out we're going to take a look at some examples of computer simulations that are in use right now. And at one six, shot. Over. Shot out. This is a flight simulator used by the military to train helicopter pilots in air-to-ground combat. Deceptively simple in its visual effects, the simulator requires a complex combination of movement and real-time response to be realistic. Although in appearance computer-generated imagery resembles certain video games, there is an important difference. Computer simulations use random factors to imitate the randomness of reality. In a sense, every computer program is a simulation, the mathematical equivalent of some sequence of events. But in their most modern forms, simulations become more and more realistic. Just as film animation achieved a remarkable level of detail in the 40s and 50s, the computer's video image is beginning to overcome its inherent flatness and is approaching a true three-dimensional appearance. By combining three-dimensionality with infinitely changing perspectives, computer imagery achieves the ultimate effect of realistic movement. In this architectural model, buildings can be viewed from almost any perspective, at ground level, from above, even through the window of a future building across the street. In this case, the computer's ability to plot and see through a building's layers has all but eliminated the need for hand-drawn blueprints. From battle games to battle grounds, a simulation can make fantasy possible and reality fantastic. But like other technological achievements, simulated imagery is a tool a tool that can be used to build, or a tool that can be used to destroy. Okay, joining us now is Frank Lewandowski. Frank is senior scientist at Singer Link, and Singer Link is involved in some very sophisticated flight simulations uh, and, and military applications of some of these flight simulations. Frank, welcome to the Computer Chronicles. Thank you. Stuart, yeah, this is a very interesting subject. This happens to be my second great love is aviation. So, <laughs> after uh, computers. After computers, of course. <laughs> computers pay for the bills. <laughs> but uh, uh, this, uh, I think, is the second generation of a program that was done, if I, I'm correct, by uh, Bruce Artwick, uh, Sublogic. Mm -hmm. I saw it on the Apple II, and it looks like it's improved quite a bit since then. Can you give us, uh, Frank and I, a demonstration? Yeah, Frank, you on? might be interested uh, in, in seeing this kind of personal computer version of a simulation, then maybe you can compare the kinds of things you do at SingerLink with this. What we have right now is the basic menu of the parameters we can use to set up the simulation. Uh, we can locate the aircraft at any particular uh, set of coordinates right now. It's positioned at an airport outside Chicago. We can program it to take off from any one of 20 different airports in the United States. Uh, we can. Uh, it's not quite the way it should be, but it will be good enough. You can set up the time here, the weather conditions, what season you want it to be in. The computer will simulate the daylight and nighttime, uh, the weather factors appropriate to that time of season, cloud layers. Uh, you can even set in a reliability factor of the hardware. This says that the plane is going at 100% reliability, uh, meaning that nothing's ever going to break down. I could set it at zero reliability and some of the pieces would not work. Okay, we'll go... Uh, 
into the simulation here. And as you can see, this is the view outside the front of the airplane, and we're sitting on the runway right now at this airport outside Chicago. You can see the sky, the ground. That's Lake Michigan out there. There's the control tower. Uh, here's our cockpit, the instrument panel of a Cessna, which is, this simulation is based on. Uh, the normal instrumentation, ground speed indicator, attitude indicator, uh, altimeter, we have our turn coordinator, heading indicator, vertical speed, tachometer, uh, navigation gear, fuel gauges, oil pressure, gear down, lights on, and so on. Uh, we'll try to take off now. It just uh, doesn't always work. I've just revved up the throttle. And <laughs> right, sorry. Well, you're the pilot, I'm not. And uh, as you can see, this is the view uh, outside as we try to take off here. We'll give a little elevator action here. We can look out the rear window and see us leaving the airport. Doesn't look like we're going to make it up here. Uh, see if there's any elevator. I think we're going to take off, actually. Uh, you can take a radar view of what's going on right now. Let's see, did we, did we make it? Yes, we're up in the air. Terrific, we're climbing. You can take a look from a radar view and see the airplane and zoom uh, out or zoom in from that perspective. Uh, we can go back to the view out the front of the airplane. Again, look out at the back of the airplane. We can see the, uh, the airport receding there. Look out the right window. Look out the left window. We can look down and visually confirm that our landing gear is still down there. It's a wheel sticking out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, and we can try to get into a turn here, and you'll see the horizon move around. That's pretty much what it does. I'll just uh, go into a stall here and crash so we can get going here. Stuart, this is a, you can tell by looking at it, it's rather a choppy scene. And uh, Frank, would you have any comments about this? This is obviously not a real-time picture that we're observing here. No, what we're doing here, of course, is that you're updating a scene which is made up of probably 20 or 30 lines, and you're updating it two to three times a second. Well, the thing is that in aircraft simulation, if we were to do the, the actual scene out of the windscreen of an aircraft, we need a much more sophisticated scene than that. Uh, a pilot just wouldn't be, uh, accept this kind of a scene in a, in, for military training. And so we usually have to go to something in the order of 8,000 edges for every television frame time and have to compute a new scene each time uh, at each television frame time, mm -hmm. as opposed to here where we're doing two or three a second. So the computer so, power that you have behind the scene generation that you're working with is considerably more than an IBM PC then? <laughs> well, I think there is probably what, one IC in this or, or so? One chip, one microprocessor chip. chip. Well, we have something in the order of 40,000 chips <laughs> in one of the visual uh, simulators that we build. Mm -hmm. So the difference is, uh, is quite substantial. What, what are the applications, Frank, of the kinds of simulations you would do at Singer Link? Well, obviously aircraft for the airlines, that kind of simulation, but that usually is limited to takeoff and landing. And that isn't a particularly difficult, uh, um, a difficult thing to train. The more difficult ones are the military ones where you're actually trying to train someone either at air-to-ground combat or air-to-air -air combat or one of those kinds of activities. The problem there, of course, is the fact that you don't, aren't training somebody just for the mechanics of, of the flight. You have in there all of the other elements, which are the, uh, the opponent, your, your, the, the other um, uh, combatants in the scene. It's, a, it's, it's an entire environment. The entire uh, scene has to be uh, simulated as well. So that's what we're in the business of doing. Maybe we could take a look. I think we have some videotape of some of the simulations that you have done, Frank. And if we could roll those now, and you could kind of give us a play-by-play -play yes. of what we're looking at. Well, this one here is a scene. It's a real-time scene. Now, what you're saying is that when this was done, it was computed on a television frame by television frame basis. Obviously, now we're playing it back from a pre-recorded flight. But in actuality, this is a, a, a scene which is computed and what we're going to see now is the A864, which is going to fire a missile. It did. We're going to now go back and track the missile to some extent. And we're going to see that what we did is we hit that tank that we had laser designated just a few minutes before. Now, these pictures, Frank, uh, I just want to make it clear. It looks like uh, you know, an artist could have done these. These are not painted. These are computer generated. Yes, and they are generated every 30th of a second. OK, so normally, again, you're not playing back a, a video disc or a videotape here. You're generating these pictures in real time. That's right. What we're going to see here in a moment is we're going, we have already fired the missile. And we're going to de laser designate the tank. And now we've hit the tank. This is the present state of the art right now in uh, computer generation. Okay. So you have a database that represents the terrain. 
And then right. you are able to then take other different perspectives on that train depending upon where you're... What you do mm -hmm. is everything in the entire world, whether it be a mountain or mm -hmm. a tree or a, our military targets as these, every one of these is coded into an X, a Y, and a Z coordinate. So what you do is from some point in space, you must then uh, record uh, the values of all of those vertices for every other, every, everything else in the, uh, in the world. And then what you do is you have this orthographic database. You then, from the particular point in space where the eye is, either whether it's my point or whether it's any of my opponents, the point is, is that we compute the scene based upon those input coordinates. And that's what takes all the computing power then is to Absolutely. compute each one of these little points. Yes. Mm -hmm. Fair. Do we have another example, I think, of... Uh... Well, what we have an example of is, is that at the present time, this, I showed this as being the present state of the art, but what we have done is we've emulated now where we're going. The next few years, we're going to be developing the texture as you see it here on the ground. We're going to be developing the trees, the, uh, the, the trees which are, uh, show foliage, and uh, as you can see, the sky, the clouds, and all of the other elements. In fact, as the, well, you couldn't quite see it, but as the helicopter got closer, you could actually see the uh, two, the pilot and the weapon system operator in the, co in the cockpit of the H-64. Now we're coming down into a village. Notice the texture on all of the buildings. Notice the tank. It's been destroyed. It's got a big hole, and, and obviously the gun is down. Frank, how long is this going to be before this sort of uh, scene generation is actually going to take place? Well, all of these elements are being done right now. At the next thing, in about a year or, or so, we'll have the texture on all of those hills, as you see. And it'll be a few years past that when we have the trees and some of the other elements of that scene. But that is where the industry is going. And when is this going to, uh, when are we going to find these in the arcade? Are not kids. <laughs> well, <laughs> some of the arcade saying. people are getting awfully close at times. Uh, some of those new scenes for, uh, are coming from video disc, and what they're doing is they're actually mixing video scenes and computer-generated scenes. Whereas on all of these, none of this is video. This is all generated frame by frame in a computer. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are other uses of computer simulations, obviously, besides flying, and one of those is in architecture. Suppose, for example, you wanted to build a new skyscraper in the middle of a city. What would the consequences of that building be? Well, we're going to take a look at computer simulations in architecture in just a moment. Okay, joining us now is Steve Harrison, who heads up the computer division of Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. That's an engineering and architecture firm in San Francisco. Welcome to the Computer Chronicle, Steve. Steve, tell us, how does an architect use computer simulations? Uh, we use it in quite a number of ways. We uh, use it in um, architecture engineering. We use it in um, perspective drawing. We use it to, shut it to study shadows in, on an urban environment. We use it to study uh, the effect of earthquakes on uh, large steel frame buildings. We do energy simulations, um, watching the performance of a building over a year as uh, the sun travels in different paths over the sky. And Frank, how would the kind of simulation that Steve is talking about differ from, from what you do? Well, the thing is that they do not have the same constraints that we do in an aircraft simulator and that theirs is not real time. We have to compute the scene dependent upon every motion that the pilot takes. If he moves the throttles or he moves the stick, the scene that we generate out the windstream of the aircraft ha has to reflect what he's done, and it must do it immediately. Now, when you said, Steve, you do earthquake simulations, uh, that's not in real time? No, it's not. We take a um, tape that was made of the actual forces in an earthquake, and then we play that against the frame that we have designed. An earthquake analysis will probably run for four or five hours on a computer, uh, whereas the actual earthquake runs for a few seconds. And we're at only looking at the most serious part of an earthquake. I think we have some, uh, some videotapes here that will show some of the drawings that they're making, right? Yeah, if we can take a look, and Steve, maybe you can give us a little explanation <laughs> as to what we're seeing. Here we're going to do some perspective studies of the City Hall of San Francisco. The building was built much before our firm was in existence. Uh, it's a wire frame representation, as though made with coat hanger wire. But in a second, we're going to fill in the uh, building with um, a gray scale. The building is kind of a gray color, so this is a pretty good representation of it. You'll notice that there is not much surface detail on it, but for the purposes of massing studies, this is quite adequate. As you can see now, we're building up the dome as a, a series of faceted elements. Mm -hmm. 
What, uh, just to give an idea of just the computing power re required to generate these pictures, what kind of a system do you have behind this? Uh, the SOM software runs on VAX computers, and the terminal is a Tektronix 4113 color raster terminal. Uh, this is a VAX 780, although the software will work just as well on the smaller VAX 730 or 750. You say SOM software, so I think your firm designs the software that does this. We've developed our own proprietary system. The uh, software you see here is called Draft, which is used for perspective drawing, uh, 3D drawing, 2D drawing. Um, we do our own software. Okay, I think we have a, a second demonstration up now, Steve, and tell us what this is. This is going to be uh, Davies Symphony Hall in San Francisco, which our firm designed. On the lower left, you see a plan view of it. On the upper left, you see an elevation of it, and on the upper right, is a perspective view. In a minute, we're going to zoom in a little closer on this perspective, um, zooming in specifically to look at the window detail, which is the sort of thing that architects are very concerned with. Uh, as you can see, the window coming up just about now. There we go. The uh, information in the lower right are the commands to run the program. Uh, these are the same kind of commands that uh, a person doing working drawings, that is, drawings that would be used to build the building, uh, would also use. Um, again, we're getting an even closer to the uh, window detail here. Are these uh, the kinds of systems that are being used throughout the industry or the architectural industry these days? Or is this something that's really very special to your company? Um, we feel it's very special to our firm, although there are a number of other firms that do have systems that begin to approach this. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to keep, um, obviously, one step ahead. There are a number of um, proprietary, of non-proprietary systems that can be purchased um, that do some aspects of this, but we have what we feel is an integrated system uh, that applies to all the architectural and engineering disciplines uh, in the firm. Would you use simulations to get involved in things like the environmental impact of a new structure? Absolutely. In fact, that's one of the major uh, uses of this particular system. Um, the massing studies, especially uh, for studying the mass of a building in a tight urban environment, um, very concerned especially with something like uh, shadow in San Francisco, where if you have a shady area in the summertime, it can be very cold that um, environmental impact reports um, spend a lot of time dealing with this pr particular subject in San Francisco. When you say massing, by the way, what do you mean by a massing study? Um, just so, the, the mass of a building, its volume, um, the blocks of it in space, uh, um, those are the sort of issues that um, architects are concerned about as well as the surface detail and the way the building goes together. You spoke about the shadow studies. I believe we have a demonstration of that right now. Maybe you could uh, walk us through this one, Steve. Right. Now we're going to look at another familiar building in San Francisco, again in plan view. This is the Bank of America World Headquarters. It just popped up in, the, in red. And then the green are shadow. It's being cast at one-hour intervals um, across uh, California Street in San Francisco. And we're going to zoom in here and look a little more closely. and see what everybody already knows, and that is that the plaza on the north side of the building will remain in shadow uh, during most of the day. Um, this is, there we go. The building is in red, and there is a shadow in the morning at one hour intervals. And as you can see, the street and the plaza remain in shadow. Now, <clears throat> Steve, is that, uh, that's a very impressive demonstration, but uh, is, there must be a considerable cost factor in that kind of simulation. Is, is studying the shadow of a building that difficult to do in a, in a sort of manual way? Yes, it is, especially if you're making major changes. Um, the traditional way is to bin, build little models, but in a place like San Francisco where there are a lot of other structures and uh, there's a large interaction between the shadows, that this is probably the easiest way to test a large number of different designs. One of the things that came up in this last uh, clip is that you showed a plan view of the building. Uh, are you using this, or do people use the, these kinds of simulations for interior design at all, placement of uh, objects within the rooms? Oh, yes. In fact, mm -hmm. the same system is used for interior perspectives as well. Interior perspectives turn out to be a very interesting problem because they have a lot more edges, uh, especially the open office sort of environment. And uh, when you do it in wireframe, it gets to be kind of a jumbled image. And when you do it um, in a hidden line drawing, you just see this great sea of uh, small lines and uh, planes across the top of the uh, partition systems. Frank, <clears throat> getting back into your kind of simulations, uh, it's very sophisticated and very realistic, but I assume there are things you still can't do. What else would you like to be able to do in, in your type of uh, military simulations? Well, of course, we would like to have a much better texture. We would like 
uh, one of the biggest problems you have is that those objects which are right in the foreground, you need much of them. You'd, you'd like to have textured surfaces. You'd like to have rocks and pebbles. If you're going to learn to drive a tank or maneuver a tank, you want this kind of detail. Well, that's very difficult to do because even in the textured scenes that you saw, that's a geometric type of texture. You'd really like to have much more realistic uh, texture. When you're talking about realistic texture, do you, do you actually go out and digitize a piece of property? Uh, is that an approach you take sometimes, figuring out where the, the rocks are? And oh, yes. To... Well, for example, when we do an airport, we mm -hmm. go out and get all of the civil engineering drawings, all of them, and then we extract the data that we want from those engineering drawings. That means that the grassy strips, any kind of shrubbery that's around it, any tree blocks that are around it, all of the buildings, all of the huts, any radar, whatever is out there, we digitize every bit of it. Frank, in about 30 seconds all the time we have, uh, how can you, you simulate the human factors? Can you simulate the, the emotional responses of the pilots in these situations, apart from just the graphics of it? Well, you remember that in addition to the graphics, which you're looking at here, out the, out the window display, you're also moving the cock, the, the, his, uh, uh, giving him all of the impression of sound. You're giving him all of the impression of the motion of that aircraft. You're giving them buffeting. You're giving them all of those other cues. And all of those put together with the realistic portrayal of the motion of that aircraft, you're giving him everything he ever needs. Steve, and, and finally a couple seconds, what would you like to do to improve your simulations? We'd like to get one of his systems. <laughs> <laughs> um, but short of that, um, that again, we would like to be able to do the kind of realistic scene that he's talking about. Um, we find that when we go from wireframe to hidden line uh, drawing, they begin to look cartoonish, and so our architects are very concerned about a very realistic scene. Okay, gentlemen, we're out of time. Frank Lewandowski of Singer Link and Steve Harrison of Skidmore, Owings & Murrow, thanks for joining us, and thank you for being with us on the Computer Chronicles. Focus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution.